The Awakening by Kate Chopin Chapter 3 It was eleven o'clock that night when Mr. Pontellier returned from Klein's hotel. He was in an excellent humor, in high spirits, and very talkative. His entrance awoke his wife, who was in bed and fast asleep when he came in. He talked to her while he undressed, telling her anecdotes and bits of news and gossip that he had gathered during the day. From his trousers pockets, he took a fistful of crumpled banknotes and a good deal of silver coin, which he piled on the bureau indiscriminately, with keys, knife, handkerchief, and whatever else happened to be in his pockets. She was overcome with sleep and answered him with little half-utterances. Well, he thought it very discouraging that his wife, who was the sole object of his existence, evinced so little interest in things which concerned him, and valued so little his conversation. Mr. Pontillier had forgotten the bonbons and peanuts for the boys. Well, notwithstanding, he loved them very much, and went into the adjoining room where they slept to take a look at them, and to make sure that they were resting comfortably. The result of his investigation was far from satisfactory. He turned and shifted the youngers, youngsters about in their beds. One of them began to kick and talk about a basket full of crabs. Mr. Pontillier returned to his wife with the information that Raoul had a high fever and needed looking after. Then he lit a cigar and went and sat near the open door to smoke it. Mrs. Pontillier was quite sure Raoul had no fever. He'd gone to bed perfectly well, she said, and nothing had ailed him all day. Mr. Pontillier was too well acquainted with fever symptoms to be mistaken. He assured her the child was consuming at that moment in the next room. He reproached his wife with her inattention, her habitual neglect of the children. If it was not a mother's place to look after children, whose on earth was it? He himself had his hands full with his brokerage business. He could not be in two places at once, making a living for his family on the street and staying home to see that no harm befell them. He talked in a monotonous, insistent way. Mrs. Pontillier sprang out of bed and went into the next room. She soon came back and sat on the edge of the bed, leaning her head down on the pillow. She said nothing and refused to answer her husband when he questioned her. When his cigar was smoked out, he went to bed, and in half a minute he was fast asleep. Mrs. Pontillier was by that time thoroughly awake. She began to cry a little and wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her peignoir. Blowing out the candle which her husband had left burning, she slipped her bare feet into a pair of satin mules at the foot of the bed and went out on the porch, where she sat down in the wicker chair and began to rock gently to and fro. It was then past midnight. The cottages were all dark. A single faint light gleamed out from the hallway of the house. There was no sound abroad except the hooting of an old owl in the top of a water oak and the everlasting voice of the sea that was not uplifted at that soft hour. It broke like a mournful lullaby upon the night. The tears came so fast to Mrs. Pontillier's eyes that the damp sleeve of her peignoir no longer served to dry them. She was holding the back of her chair with one hand. Her loose sleeve had slipped almost to the shoulder of her uplifted arm. Turning, she thrust her face, steaming and wet into the bend of her arm, and she went on crying there, not caring any longer to dry her face, her eyes, or her arms. She could not have told why she was crying. Such experiences as the foregoing were not uncommon in her married life. They seemed never before to have weighed much against the abundance of her husband's kindness and a uniform devotion which had come to be tacit and self-understood. An indescribable oppression which seemed to generate in some unfamiliar part of her consciousness now filled her whole being with a vague anguish. It was like a shadow, like a mist passing across her soul's summer day. It was strange and unfamiliar. It was a mood. She did not sit there inwardly upbraiding her husband and lamenting at fate, which had directed her footsteps to the path which they had taken. She was just having a good cry all to herself. The mosquitoes made merry over her, biting her firm round arms and nipping at her bare insteps. The little stinging, buzzing imps succeeded in dispelling a mood which might have held her there in the darkness half a night longer. The following morning, Mr. Pontillier was up in good time to take the rock away which was to convey him to the steamer at the wharf. He was returning to the city to his business, and they would not see him again at the island until the coming Saturday. He had regained his composure, which seemed to have been somewhat impaired the night before. He was eager to be gone, as he looked forward to a lively week in Carondelet Street. Mr. Pontillier gave his wife half of the money which he'd brought away from Klein's hotel the evening before. She liked money as well as most women, and accepted it with no little satisfaction. "'Oh, it'll buy a handsome wedding present for Sister Janet!' she exclaimed, smoothing out the bills as she counted them one by one. 
Oh, we'll treat Sister Janet better than that, my dear, he laughed as he prepared to kiss her goodbye. The boys were tumbling about, clinging to his legs, imploring that numerous things be brought back to them. Mr. Pontillier was a great favorite, and ladies, men, children, even nurses were always on hand to say goodbye to him. His wife stood smiling and waving, and the boys shouting as he disappeared in the old rockaway down the sandy road. A few days later, a box arrived from Mrs. Pontillier from New Orleans. It was from her husband. It was filled with friandises with luscious and toothsome bits, the finest of fruits, pâtés, a rare bottle or two, delicious syrups, and bonbons in abundance. Well, Mrs. Pontillier was always very generous with the contents of such a box. She was quite used to receiving them when away from home. The pâtés and fruit were brought to the dining room. The bonbons were passed around. And the ladies, selecting with dainty and discriminating fingers, and a little greedily, all declared that Mr. Pontillier was the best husband in the world. Mrs. Pontillier was forced to admit that she knew of none better.